morning. So wonderful to see you all. I love hearing the chitter chatter of visiting. I love the fact that you love each other so much that I love the hugs. And in all of that, this, uh, the words to this song surely says what you are feeling right now as the presence of the Lord right now is in this place. So will you join Cindy and I this morning as we begin our service, drawing the Lord because he is already here in our presence. Yes, he is. Sure. That's, that's me. Okay, all right. That was my cue. All right. Uh, I, uh, welcome. Welcome to First Methodist Church. It's a, a gift to be here with you today and to share in this time. One of our favorite times in the week is when we get to gather together in the presence of Jesus to give him praise and thanksgiving. I'm Pastor Brady. It's Pastor April. Uh, we're grateful you're here, whether you're joining us online or in person. Um, we're so thankful we're here and that today we get to celebrate the love and the grace of Jesus by coming to the table uh, as a tangible reminder of what he's done for us, of his, his love for us that changes us and fills us and, and um, the life that he gives to us. So we're grateful that you're here and that you get to share this time together. Uh, we'll, we'll continue worship as we stand and sing. Let's continue to worship this morning. Joyful, joyful. Oh, 
kids to come forward at this time to go off to Children's Church. We have some. All right. <laughs> Y'all, come on down. All right. Well, it's great to see you girls today. We're so excited that we have a chance to go to Children's Church, and y'all are going to come back in worship today. Oh, oh, all right. There we go. All right. Good deal. All right. Better late than never, right? I love it. I like coming in with some enthusiasm. That's some good stuff. We are going to come back in service today afterwards to share in communion with us. And we're so excited that you'll be with us because it's not communion without y'all here. So let's have prayer together. If you bow with me, um, Jesus, we love you. And we are so thankful that we get to come here today to worship you to hear stories about you, and to celebrate your love for us that you gave to us through a meal. So be with our children as they go, that they may experience you, that we may all experience your grace and your goodness again. In Jesus' name, amen. Join me in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended in the heaven, and he sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and of life everlasting. Amen. I forgot to announce earlier in, in the, the welcome, um, you might see that a lot of our construction projects that have been going on are being completed. I think they'll be finished up this week, but I hope you enjoy our new dance floor out here. Um, we're going to show those Baptists a thing or two about how Methodists get down. So no, I'm, I'm teasing. That's going to be one of our new welcome spaces. I love that I made April spit her water out. So that's, that's good. Uh, mission accomplished. <laughs> So that's going to be our new welcome space and um, a place where our parents will check in their kids on Sunday mornings. Um, it's going to be a great thing you'll see kind of transform over the next couple weeks. Um, but we're excited about the work we're doing to prepare our facilities for some fruitful ministry for the next few years. So uh, it's exciting to see these things. And again, you'll see the campus continue uh, to develop over the next few weeks and, and months. So uh, we're excited about those changes. Again, all this stuff we've been able to do have been because of your generosity. And so uh, it's amazing to get to do this work and, and to prepare our buildings. One of our greatest resources for the ministry that we're called to do of making disciples, we're able to do that because of your generosity. And so thank you for that. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Father, we know that the church is far more than a building, yet we know that a building is vital for doing the work of making disciples, of having a home base where we can and uh, join you in your work of transforming hearts and lives, that we may become a reflection of you, then go out into the world to bring the good news to those who've yet to hear it. So we thank you and celebrate the work that's taking place here because we know it's more than just walls being knocked down and things being built, God. This is work that's going to happen here where, where lives are going to be changed by what you do, by creating room for those people who you have yet to call here but plan to do so. 
So we are excited. We look forward to what you have. And we continue to give just with the expectation that, God, you're going to move, that you long to do great things through your church. And we invite you to do those things through us. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Lord, time is moving so quickly. The children we must have, must, the children that we have had, we can see even in this community continue to grow up and up and up. And Lord, we know that our children are perfect examples of, of you and all that you can do and all that they can do and learn. That their capacity to, lo is, to love is far beyond compare. They are our examples. They are the ones that set the pace on loving, on trusting. And even though they may not be patient at times, their innocence is, it keeps their heart open and their minds open as well. They know how to perfectly receive you. That all that grace and love that you continue to pour over all of us, it is them who can receive it perfectly. It is I and others who struggle to keep our hearts open and our minds open to receive all that you have to give it to us. Be patient with us. 
Because our minds can get distracted. Our priorities can become unbalanced. Our concerns can become overwhelming. And whether we are parents or grandparents or great-grandparents or one of the people in this community that raised up our kids just by your example alone, we know what happened between our childhood and now. We know that we've let this world get to us, to reside within us. And encourage us to do things in the name of competition and winning. But Lord, we know the true gift is the one that you gave to us. That there's nothing we can earn, nothing we can keep, nothing we can gain here. That it's going to even hold a candle to what you have done for us and continue to do for us. So thank you. Thank you as we learn how to lean on you in all times, not just good or bad, but all of them. Help us to maintain a constant conversation with you, Lord, in such a way that we are always feeling your presence right here with us. Because we know that when we walk with you, Jesus, We know that we can be held safe from harm. We can hold fast the faith that has been instilled in us. We know that we can be strong and even courageous when we don't want to be. This is the influence that you have on us. Thank you. There is so much to celebrate The fact that we are never alone. The fact that we can seek healing through him, through you. We are grateful and we are humbled to know that looking up instead of looking down and focusing on our own things, that we can find a way to walk this world well and to live gracious and humbled lives. And maybe, just maybe, Lord, we can be strong enough and represent you enough so that one other person may learn about you just by the interactions that we've had with them. We know know that it's difficult to be able to walk that line. And we thank you We thank you, Jesus, for creating a a prayer that you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, so we are in uh, the last sermon in our series of, of what it means to be the kind of followers of Jesus who bear much fruit in their lives. And in this call to be fruitful followers of Jesus is tied to God's first command to humanity that shows up in the very beginning of the book of Genesis. The first thing that God says to this new creation of humanity, his image bearers, is be fruitful. Be fruitful. Be the kind of people who produce fruit of flourishing in the world around you. And I think for many of us, there is this deep intrinsic desire to bear fruit, to live the kind of life that blesses far beyond ourselves. 
I think many of us have probably bought into the idea that we hear in the world of, a, of, of life as being gathering for ourselves, seeking good and, and blessings for ourselves. But hopefully, if you've bought into that at some point, you've, you've exhausted that to realize that life isn't about just gathering things and blessings for myself. But real life is found when I'm sharing in the work of God and blessing other lives and blessing God through the life and the things that he's given me. I, I'm operating under the assumption that you have that desire. And no one is nodding their heads. All right, so we'll <laughs> just move on to the next sermon series. All right, I, I'm just going to go ahead and continue with that assumption. All right, that, that I think we want to be fruit bearers, right? We want our lives to produce good, good things. And Jesus teaches us about what that looks like by using a powerful image and a very easy for us to understand image of, of him being a vine and us being branches with the intention that we bear fruit. Easy image to understand. Um, today I'm going to let I'm bring Jerry back. I introduced him to you. <laughs> Happy to report he's still alive. All right, so... I introduced Jerry the money tree last week to you. I confess that I am not good at keeping plants alive. I don't have a green thumb. I have a, a brown thumb. I don't know what you call it, but I can't keep things alive just to save, well, their lives, I guess. And um, Jerry's looking pretty, there's a few concerning spots, so I might need to send him to the dermatologist but, uh, to get burned off. But we, had, we spent way too much time as a staff talking about how to keep Jerry alive this week. So I... He's in better hands than just mine, but, but Jesus, this is the image he uses of him being a vine, kind of the, the, the one who provides a nutrients for life, um, and, and that us being the branches that ultimately through the resources of the vine produce fruit. And part of the image in John 15 that Jesus is talking about is the very natural process for anything that bears fruit. Uh, for a tree or a vine, um, it is that a vine it will enter a season of rest. A rest is a natural part of the life of a vine. And in that season of rest, a good gardener will come and prune away uh, the places that need, um, that are struggling to grow, the places that might need um, new life for growth. And that out of that pruning and that season of rest comes a season where the plant wakes up and growth begins to take place. And it's that growth that begins to provide what's needed for fruitfulness. And so fruit comes from just the natural process. If we're thinking of us as brand, it's, it's through the natural process of what happens within the plant. And Jesus takes this image to your life and to mine into our life with God. And Jesus says, if you want to be fruitful, one well, of the first things that you need to do in your life is you need to introduce rest. Sabbath. Which goes against the grain, I think, in our society of doers, right? We have to do and always be doing something to be fruitful. What Jesus says and the creation narrative says to us, no, rest is a vital part of fruitfulness. In fact, fruitfulness begins with resting, because resting creates capacity. Without a season of rest, no vine or tree or plant has a hope to produce fruit. Because out of a season of rest for us, which creates capacity for renewal, Jesus says the Father, who is the gardener, will come and prune us. We'll see those places in our lives that might prevent us from fruitfulness. And in his mercy, he comes for those sins and attitudes that are non-fruit-bearing, and he will trim and sometimes cut those things away. And that sounds intimidating but for some of us, and I mean, perhaps it is to a degree, but it's for a wonderful purpose. Jesus says the Father prunes not to get at us, right? It's so that we might become more fruitful. And, and then after this, this pruning takes place, it provides the place for growth to come in. And when that growth takes place in our life, it's out of that that God through us begins to produce fruit. It's out of this natural process. Man, this, Jesus uses this to say, if you are a branch and your call is to bear fruit, 
It is simply to live in cooperation with what God promises to do in you. Of trusting in this Jesus who says simply, find a place in me and allow my Father to work in you and you'll produce fruit. And so that's the picture that Jesus gives us of of what it means for us to grow and be those who bear fruit uh, for the kingdom that bless God and other people. And so we're going to pick up today with in John 15 with this image, and we're going to, to look at verse 5, which is, for us, the crux of all of this. There's eight verses that Jesus uses here to tell us about the fruit-bearing life, and this one is key. And, and so let's, give, let's pay attention to Jesus' vision for what a fruit-bearing life is. Jesus says, I am the vine. And you are the branches. If you remain or abide, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. So one thing that we notice here is that the word abide shows up again. We, we spent some time unpacking the idea of abiding last week, and we're going to continue to build on that because it's the whole passage hinges around abiding. In fact, Jesus uses the word abide ten times in the first ten verses of John 15. That's how important it is. And, and there was something that we didn't say last week that I think we have to address this week because for many of us, we might be associating this. I think oftentimes when we think about our relationship with Jesus, for many of us, the automatic thought is, is that, well, that is hard. It's difficult to be in relationship with Jesus. There's a lot that goes into that. I feel daunting uh, when I think about my relationship with Jesus. And here's where the, the idea of abiding speaks to us and hopefully corrects or maybe our assumptions in that way. Because abiding is not striving. I mean, let's look at Jesus' image. Do you think a branch strives to be connected to the vine? Do you think a branch strives to bear fruit? That it like somehow like, like strives hard to, to bear fruit? It, it doesn't. Like... It just stays connected. It's the most natural thing for a branch to do. And so abiding isn't striving. In fact, abiding is the opposite of striving. One of the meanings for the word abide, which is the Greek word meno, is actually resting. It means to be at rest in something. Or better yet, it means to be at home in something. Now, there's an image that we can get behind. I mean, you know what it's like to have a hard day at work or just a hard day in your life. And, and, and when you're walking through that day, like, you're, all your thought is, like, I just need to get home. Like, I, I can't wait to go sink into my favorite chair and to turn on whatever show I want to watch and to sit down with loved ones or, or, or cuddle up with love, like, like whatever it is. Like, you know what it's like to say, I just, I just can't wait to be at home. Because at home, like, I can get away from all the things that are the strivings and the difficulties, right? Like, at home is a place where I can just recharge and I can be myself and I'm renewed at home. I mean, my family and I, we just got back from vacation, and we went to Colorado, and man, Colorado, when you're trading Texas in July for Colorado, like, oh, man, like, whoa, that's, like, the temperature is wonderful, there's mountains around you, it's beautiful, and we stayed at an awesome place, and it was just a wonderful time, eight days of just, oh, like, it was just good, but even then, like, we were excited to go home, because as Dorothy tells us, like, there's no place like home, right, like, (laughs) 
I mean, you're like, my, as comfortable as that bed was, like it's, but it's not my bed, you know? Like, I'm looking forward to oh, being asleep in my bed and being home in my space. Like, we get that image, and this is what Jesus uses to say, this is what your relationship with God should be like. Not striving, not worrying. Like, Jesus should be a home for you. Jesus should be the reprieve from striving, not the source of it. That Jesus should be the one that we run to. And the the way Jesus talks about this, this resting in him, he gives you two means of which we rest in him here in these first 10 verses. Jesus says, I'm a, a refuge for you um, through prayer. That, that, that prayer becomes not a, a difficult thing. It becomes a thing that we use because we can't wait to tuck away into Jesus. To run into his presence and to find that, that renewal and his life beginning to pour into us. And Jesus says the other way in which we begin to abide, we begin to rest or find a home in him, is actually when his words begin to find a home in us. And they begin to teach us and encourage us and challenge us and shape us. This is what Jesus uses. This is how we abide. He begins to work it within us, and, and he begins to be a home, a, a source of, of rest and renewal and joy. I think a great way to take and understand what Jesus means by, by our abiding is, is to say that we bear fruit for God out of our friendship with God. That's the key. I think verse 5 is what it will essentially say to us. If you want to be a fruit-bearing Christian, if you want to be a follower of Jesus whose life produces good things that makes God smile, right? Like the good things that are going to be celebrated in heaven where God reigns. We bear fruit for God out of our friendship with God. What a glorious reality. And something that we have to understand. And our friendship with God is nurtured through the abiding the resting, the finding a home in him. And, and just in case we're, we're, we're looking at verse 5 and we're still ready to dismiss this and its importance to us, the, the idea of abiding and what it means for us, look at the second part of, of this verse here. Because Jesus is going to give us a dramatic contrast between those who abide in him and those who don't. Jesus says, if you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. If you don't, you'll produce nothing. (laughs) Jesus says, if you rest in me, you find a home in me, and you seek me in prayer in a way that I can minister to you, you let my words be a part of your life, that you like ingest them. Let's think about the elements of communion. You ingest them away where they begin to leave their mark on your life and begin to shape your character and your desires. Like if you do this, then you will bear much fruit. But if you don't, if you're not pursuing me in prayer, if you're not allowing my words to shape you and change you, you will produce nothing. I mean, you can have a greater contrast than that. And Jesus says, you know what the difference is between bearing much fruit and and none? It's not how smart you are. It's not how much you know uh, about the Bible necessarily. It's not about how much you come to church. He says, no, it's about how much you abide in me. It's about how much you find rest, your soul finds rest in me about whether you find a home in me or not. And that's, that's it. That's the difference. Whether or not we abide, we either produce much fruit or we produce nothing. And you might be thinking, nothing? <laughs> that's strong. Like, I can't do anything, anything apart from Jesus. I don't think it's that we can't do anything. I think what Jesus is saying, you you won't do anything of lasting value to the kingdom apart from me. 
I think that's the way he wants us to hear this. It's not that you can't go do a good thing if you don't believe and trust and walk with Jesus. But when it comes to the things of the kingdom that the Father receives glory from, Jesus says, look, you're not going to do any, part, any of that stuff apart from the king. The kingdom work to which you're called is to be done in conjunction with the king, not apart from him. You abide in me, you'll produce fruit. You see, what abiding does, what finding a home in Jesus and, and giving him that place in, in our lives to minister to us as, as though we are the 12 with him, what, what happens in that is that abiding creates overflow. It does. I mean, prayer and scripture, worship is your... It creates an overflow where the life of God, of Jesus' own life, in the same way that a vine nourishes the branches, it pours into us so that fruit just becomes the natural part of who we are because the life of Jesus fills us and flows out of us. And that's what produces the fruit. It's the overflow of Jesus' grace and love and goodness that we are experiencing that's changing us that eventually goes out into the world and spills out from who we are, touching other things. That's what abiding does. We bear fruit for God out of our friendship with God. That's what we need to hear. We bear fruit for God out of our friendship with God. Let's look at verse 6. Preacher's getting awfully preachy today. All right, so we got to move on. We got a meal we got to share, and I don't miss meals. All right, so let's, let's especially this one. All right, so let's look at verse 6. Um, a, a word of warning here with this verse. In verse 6, Jesus says, If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you hear Jesus' words a lot, you're used to hearing these kind of things sometimes. And, and it is a word of warning, and it catches your attention. And if it does, if that's what happens for you when you hear this. And I think the automatic reaction for many of us when we begin to hear these kind of words is we get challenged by them. And, and we begin to think, um, oh my goodness, is that me? Am I producing fruit? And for many of us, we go into this automatic kind of assessment of fruit in our life. Are we producing this kind of fruit? And if that's you, you hear these words and that happens, um, good. That's what Jesus wants these words to do. He, he wants this to set you back for a moment and to truly begin to think, am I producing kingdom fruit in my life? Is my life arranged in a way where I'm finding Jesus as a refuge, not an inconvenience? Am I allowing the life of Jesus to minister to me in a way that it just is bursting out of my life? Some of us are going to hear these words and be very um, unsettled by them. And I really do think these words need to be balanced out a little bit. By, by some of Jesus' teachings and other places, and, and specifically a parable in, in Luke chapter 13. So Jesus tells a parable about a, a man who had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he goes to inspect it for fruit, but he doesn't find any. And here's what he says. He goes, he goes to the vine dresser, the one who's responsible for tending to it, and he says, "'For three years I've looked for fruit from this tree, and it hasn't produced any fruit.'" Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? And so three years, once a, a tree or a vine in Israel was, was ready to produce fruit, three years is a long time for a vine to produce nothing. And so it's understandable that, that the landowner would be frustrated by this point. But here's what the vine dresser says. Leave it alone for another year. I'll dig around it and fertilize it, and if it bears fruit next year, fine. Good. If not, then cut it down. Here's what Jesus wants us to hear in this. God is patient. He's 
patient with us to become the kind of trees and vines that produce fruit for the kingdom. The kind of followers who produce fruit. There's an element of this that, that, that is there for us to balance out with, I think, this word of warning from Jesus. Um, but, but I think we, we do also have to hold this intention with what Jesus is saying here. Because part of the reality here that, we, that Jesus wants us to confront is that if we hold ourselves to be followers of Jesus and yet we choose not to abide and find a home in Jesus, if we really have no desire to join Jesus in his work in the world, then we have to ask ourselves, are we really connected to the vine? We do. If there's no desire in you for that, if you only look at life with Jesus as cumbersome and an inconvenience to you, if you don't, you have other things that you're more concerned about and you aren't worried about his work in the world, his love being manifest in the world, then like you have to ask, are you really connected to the vine in the way in which he calls you to be connected to him? Because if you really believe in Jesus, let's think about this. If we really believe in Jesus, and I'm saying more than just giving mental assent to the, the idea that he lived at one point in his life, was present in this world, if we really trust in Jesus and believe that he holds the key to life, that he is who he claimed to be, that he's the one who holds abundant life for you and for me, under, he's a key to everything and understanding everything in the world. Won't we naturally want to be close to him? Like, won't that be a natural desire for us to say, gosh, I, I want to know and grow and serve this wonderful Jesus? I think we have to balance that with, with these words and the, and the patience of God as we become the kind of followers who bear fruit. But that becomes something that we work through as those seeking to follow him. Let's look at verse 7. Man, verse 7 is one of those that, that catches our attention. Um, Jesus says, if you remain in me, word abide again, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Whatever you wish. That usually gets our attention, isn't it? Like I find um, it's like our six-year-old self comes out when we hear this verse. We're like, I can ask for a pony? You know, like uh, <laughs> again, like let's look at what Jesus, let's look at the whole of what Jesus is saying. Jesus isn't Santa Claus and saying, Here's your, give me your wish list. Like Jesus is saying, if you, this comes out of our abiding Jesus says, if my words remain, if they're abiding in you. What Jesus is saying is, look, if, if you are nurturing your friendship with me, if you find a home in me as a refuge, and you're pursuing me in prayer, allowing my presence to minister to you, if you're letting your words be present in me and to shape your life and inform who you are and speak to your desires in a way that your desires begin to be transformed, because that's what happens when Jesus becomes a home to us. Walk with Jesus long enough and your desires will begin to become his desires. We're changed. It's what relationships do. They change us. Think about the relationships you have in your life. The closest ones have a way of changing you naturally. And Jesus says, look, if you're abiding in me, and your desires are changing. We find ourselves walking in sync together, not, not in opposition to each other, but in sync together. Oh, man, you can ask anything. Ask your desires that reflect my desire, and I'll be pleased to give it to you. I'll find joy in giving you whatever you want. What a wonderful promise to us. Gosh, are we abiding in a way where our desires are reflecting the desires of Jesus that we see in his word. If you find yourself there, man, the will of God is no longer a mystery. It just becomes a part of who you are. 
And Jesus says, when you do, like there's a freedom and access oh, you have as a believer to my vast and eternal resources. What a compelling verse and challenge to us. Verse 8, Jesus concludes this, this fruit-bearing life with these words. He says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It's to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. I, I think it's worth us looking at what it means to bear fruit. We can't miss this series and not know what kind of fruit our life should be producing. And, and I'll give you just a few that the Scriptures tell us. This is the fruit of, of God's Spirit, of Jesus' words abiding in us. Um, to bear fruit, Jesus says in John 13, 34, and 35, is to do the works of love that are signs of our discipleship to Jesus. Jesus says, fruit looks like a new command that I give you, which is to love one another. As I have loved you, sacrifice, selflessness, selfless love. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another, as I have loved you. Your life, if you're, the words of Jesus are abiding and you're walking with the Spirit, is in, like this is what it, you'll produce the works of love that Jesus produced. That's the fruit. Another one is a transformed character. Look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. The fruit of the Spirit. What does this produce? Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All qualities of our inner character and life that inform the life that we live. Jesus says, look, my words abide in you. Find a home like this is going to change you. It's going to change who you are. You're going to find these characteristics will become a part of who you are as you are pruned. It also produces the fruit of praise to God. Hebrews 13, 15 says, though... Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Our praise is a testimony to God's goodness and faithfulness. The scriptures will tell us it is vital for his people to get together and sing, that it's a testament to one another, and it's a testament to the world around us. And part of the questions I'll ask you, and Lori didn't tell me to say this, but I'm, I'm, I'm saying it kind of for her, but for us, is what, what kind of gift are you giving God through your singing? Because I hear the attitude a lot um, where people go, well, I don't like singing. It's not for me. I'm my favorite thing about church. And let me take that on. Because the underlying assumption with that is that you're thinking it's about you. Some pruning there, right? Ouch. Yeah, ouch. Like church is just for you to get out of it what you want to get. Oh, yeah, that, now you're going, oh, um, uh, goodness, Oof, that hurts. It does hurt. Yeah, well, good, it should. Like, like, it's not about you. The song you say, it's not about you. It's not about whether you like it or not. It's not about your preference of me. It doesn't care. It doesn't matter what kind of songs we sing or style of me. Like the song you offer is a gift to God. It's a witness to his goodness, an expression, just words that you feed you of an expression of, of what he's done in your life. And so it's simply an offering. And it doesn't matter how good you sing or poorly you sing. It doesn't matter at all. It's the offering of your heart to God through the gift of song, expression of joy for what he's done in your life. We get one more song today for you to sing, to, to redeem yourself if you're like, oh, golly. Um, whew, all right. Um, and the last one I'll give you um, is good deeds. Good deeds produces good deeds. And, and let me be specific about good deeds. Deeds where the Father gets glory and not you. All right. Not the good deeds where people go, oh, man, aren't they a swell person? 
for he is a jolly good fellow. Like, I, I, no, not those deeds, no. It produces a deed where people go, man, isn't God good? Jesus in Matthew 5, 16 says, In the same way let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. The and is really important there. It produces the kind of deeds where people see the glory of God through what you do. Awesome. Awesome. This is the kind of fruit that we should long for in our life, the fruit of praise, the fruit of self-sacrificing love, the fruit of our character beginning to be shaped to look more and more like Jesus Christ in the presence of his spirit at work within us. And the good deeds that bring the Father glory. That's what he holds out for us. Jesus says the motivation for a fruitful life should be that you long to bring glory to your Father in heaven aware of all that he's done for you. You look at your life and you say, with all that I have and all that I am, I want to bring God glory. He deserves it for what he has done, what he has given in his son, in the sacrifices that he's made for someone like me, that he gives me the opportunity to bless him as he has blessed me. What a gift to use our life in such a way that we testify to the world of God's goodness. Church, if we, if we looked at our life this way, man, I don't think it'd be hard to reach a world for Christ. I think it'd be far easier than we maybe assume it is. If we ministered out of this overflow and allowed God to produce this fruit, I think we'd see our community our homes, our world transformed. And that's the hope. Um, we're going to respond in, in prayer and kind of open our hearts up to, this, to come to this table today. Um, so I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Jesus, we thank you so much for being the one who invites us to bear fruit for the glory of God. We have in us this desire to bring glory to God because we know what God has done for us. We're humbled by it. And we feel no need to earn God's love because we know that's freely given to us. But gosh, it is a glorious response to just say, I want to do this for you. And so be at work in us. As we come to this table, challenge our hearts Challenge those places in our life that need to be pruned and pulled back. Maybe those false sense of of thinking, be it sins, whatever it might be, prune us. Fill us with your life that we may grow and that fruit might overflow out of our life. It's our desire. We wouldn't seek to do this apart from you. We need you, Jesus, for this. And let this meal where we come to celebrate your love, let this be a means by which you fill us once again with your love and your grace and your mercy that we might walk away from this table of changed people, ready to go and share the spirit with the world around us. It's our desire, Jesus, be at work within us. Amen. Just before his words in John 15, this is two chapters before Jesus shares these words. He sits down to a table with his disciples. Again, just hours before he will offer his life and be arrested and beaten and crucified for you and for me. He sits down at this table and he gives his followers a meal by which we'll remember his sacrifice, the life given to us. And he says, by taking the tangible elements of the meal, he says of this bread, this bread represents my body given for you, broken for you. And he says, take and eat. Let this find its place within you and your heart and your life. In that meal, Jesus took the cup, and he said, this is a cup of a new covenant, of a new way of being in relationship with God, not based on your obedience, 
to God, but instead my obedience to the Father on your behalf is the true vine. And it's my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins that you might receive new life. And he said, take and drink. And so we offer these to God, asking the Holy Spirit to work through these, that as we receive these, we might be filled anew with his Spirit. I'm going to ask those who are assisting with communion to go ahead and come forward. So this is an open table for communion, which means that if you're someone who has put your hope and your trust in Jesus and you're seeking to follow him, you're invited to come and share in this meal. This meal is a gift of of his grace given toward us. And so we're going to invite you to come and to share. We'll have you come. The ushers will lead us uh, through the inside aisle to come and receive the gift of the bread and the cup. And you're welcome to kneel here at the altar or just surrounded if there's not space to pray uh, whatever prayer you feel led to do and then you'll make your way back to your seat through the outside aisle but this is a time for the community to come and to respond
Join me in singing. Glad you weren't expecting me to sing that last verse. All right, so it's a, um, you see how poor my offering can be to God sometimes. It's not how good it not sounds, but it's uh, it's good to be with you here today. I'm, I'm just man, Pastor Brady. It's great to just join you today. Thank you for coming to visit with us. And if you're a first time guest, we're so thankful you chose to join us for Communion Sunday, and hope you were encouraged. We have a gift for you in the back, uh, so be sure to to go and receive that as, as you go. Um, we have just a couple announcements. One of those, we had our garage sale yesterday. Um, I got to connect with a lot of people from the community, which was part of uh, the hope and intention of the garage sale. We also made $6,000, so uh, thank you, yeah, which is going to help pay for our dance floor, so that's good, good news. So um, that's right. If y'all want to boogie, instead of going to Sunday school class, just let us know, but uh, Thank you for that. We have an opportunity next week, a uh, great opportunity for our church. We're having uh, Pop-Up Sunday, which we have a number of our students are moving up a grade, some to junior high and, and some into you know, kids' ministry, so we're calling it Pop-Up Sunday. We're also having Backpack Blessings as a part of, of Pop-Up Sunday. That's where we pray over all of the students, faculty, administrators, anybody dealing with education on any level. Uh, we begin to pray over you. You'll be prayed over personally in worship. And so uh, that's going to be a wonderful thing. If you've been, uh, we often ask those who were once in the schools as teachers or administrators to join us in praying for people in our, serv- our three services. So if that's you, uh, let us know. We'd love to have you come and be a part of praying over our, our students and-, and people who are getting ready to start the school year. Uh, so see April and I, we'd love to plug you into one of the services or b- several of the services. Uh, as a part of that day, we're having a carnival after our 11 o'clock services. We're going to have food and games. I know what you're thinking. It's August, Brady. Um, We've got misters and swamp coolers. It's going to be awesome. Uh, (laughs) Half of the games and food will be inside, so no fear about that. Um, But this is a chance. This Sunday is a Sunday where we have more guests uh, that come to our church almost than Easter. So Easter might eclipse Backpack Blessing Sunday, but not by much. So this is a chance for us as a church to put our foot forward to serve our community, to embody the love of Jesus in this way. So we need you to serve. In fact, we're asking a lot of our families that have kids going uh, to not serve, uh, just to have fun with their kids at the carnival. That's part of what it's for, uh, and to meet people uh, from the community. So that means um, if you're not having a kid go, then we'd love for you to serve. And it's, only, it's less than two hours. It'll be easy and fun. And, um, and so sign up. Uh, we probably have some spots inside, so you better hurry. Uh, sign up if, <laughs> if you want one of those spots. But um, please, please serve. This is one of those chances to do something great and to make connections with people who may not know the Lord or have a church family. So please, uh, please do that. Um, so with that, we're going to, to leave. Our benediction today is simply, oh, what a gift that... That the way that we produce fruit to bring glory to the Father comes through our friendship with Him. What a gift. It's not our striving. It's not hard. It's just natural that we nurture our life and stay connected. God will work through us to bring fruit that brings Him glory. May we be the church that abides and therefore produces fruit. Amen. Let's sing this chorus as we leave.